So my take home message here is that when the first language acquisition process can be triggered in the absence of language input, the child with the language ready brain still yields language. The trick here is how do you trigger it? And there's a few um, definitions I need to go with. Um, language is not just communication. Uh, it's a specific complex kind of rule governed set. Everyone knows the standard language, whatever you think your native language is. When I say language, I mean that. I mean the whole shebang, not something language like the whole thing. So it's not just communication. I language. To be thought of as language competence, our name is specified in the language expectations that guide the language emerging process. And it's important to have this here because this is one of the four instincts that I'm talking about that draws us to language. E language is just up there for comparison. Um, I'm calling it a product of language use available in the environment external to the child. Noam said he didn't like any definitions of E language, so whatever he was happy with, he can put in that box. Okay, so here are the, I, I, I'm going to do just the depth, I'm going to give you the four instincts up front, then we're going to go through some data and I'm going to tie them back together for you. The first one, and the one I'm going to focus on the most here, and I think it ties a lot to the work on music perception, it ties a, to a lot of things, is sensitivity to prosody and sequencing that leads acquirers to attend to relevant input. Um, while we find in a, um, a deaf person's environment, who has not been exposed to signing is a lack of this kind of periodic um, stimulus that they would be drawn to for language. Obviously, there's communication tied with that stimulus. But once they see this, they gravitate to it, they fix on it, much like um, we were hearing about the music case. It's truly a drawing. The second one, I don't know if you can see my little pictures up there, but. Um, is awareness of your ability to copy certain language relevant stimuli and a tendency to attempt to copy such stimuli. So for those of you who um, work with mirror neurons, mirror neurons make sense. The fact that we, we recognize that we can do certain things that others of our species can do and the fact that we actually are kind of drawn to copy things that others of our species can do. By The third one, I language, is an innate set of language expectations that drive, direct, and supplement the first language acquisition process. Um, it's in red for a reason, and I will explain that reason in a second. And the fourth one, the little picture on the top is peer pressure, is a drive to match the output of one's first language acquisition to already existing target languages available in the environment. So when I talk about Emil, I'm talking about Coming more like taking on aspects of the language that's around you. Tying this piece a bit to theory of mind, I think the fact that theory of mind comes in somewhat late for children is actually a good thing because it keeps the clutter out. It allows them to analyze and build a language without having to worry what other people think about it. It's only when they've got something in place that now with theory of mind it helps to become somewhat like the people around you. So three is in red because and the interesting thing about working with the home signers that home said language isolates that we work with is that one, two, and four, uh, well, one and two are not critical um, critical period bound. Four starts late, so you could say that its critical period has a beginning point. Um, the three is the only one that disappears at some stage. It's the only one that allows someone who doesn't have any access to the appropriate language input to get into adulthood and not have a language. Um, and you will see all those other ones, you will see people exposed at varying ages, you know, 15, 20, 30, 48, drawn to and using, but without eye language to guide you, you can't get very far. So let's talk about the non-emergence of language. Um, in hearing populations, language deprivation occurs in the context of severe social neglect. So we have feral children, we have children like Jamie. Deaf populations are unique because deaf children can be socialized and nurtured, but they can also be deprived of access to a spoken language. And by virtue of um, inability, because of their 
by virtue of their inability to hear, but also if their families are hearing, which is often the case in the United States and in Europe for 94 to, um, what's it now? Yeah, 94 to 96 percent of the population in, in, in European countries in the U.S. That's you've got hearing parents with deaf children, so these kids can be isolated from a sign language as well, and often are. In Nicaragua, it's going to be a little bit different. There isn't a high, as high a proportion. So remember, I said like you know, six, six to ten percent. You don't even have that in Nicaragua. There's a very, very low proportion of deaf children born to deaf parents. In fact, we've only found a few in the last few years, and we found a few somewhat before that who um, their parents were fairly limited in their communication skills, their parents were uh, not involved in raising them. So it's very, very hard to find the deaf children, the deaf, the deaf child of deaf parents in the world. We have cases now, and we have a case you'll see here too of deaf with a deaf aunt who had exposure from an early age, but it's not even as common as here. So what we've been doing is not documenting the non-emergence, although we have, um, or the emergence of language in a language context. We're documenting the case of emergence of language from what I would argue is <coughs> non-language. If you take the definition of language that I gave at the beginning, not communication, but something that has the properties that we look at as a human language, um, these kids did not have that in their input. And that's why this case is an important so they, this, the language that came into being draws heavily on gesture, but you have to think of that. It draws on gesture for its raw materials, not for its grammar. So a sign may well draw on a gesture. And, and you know, even some of the grammatical markers draw on facial expressions that are part of Nicaraguan culture. But once they're drawn in to the linguistic system that is Nicaraguan sign language, their function, their nature completely changes. They're just raw materials. Now, I'm going to use the term language isolates. Um, I, I make a distinction between language isolates and what Susan was talking about as home signers. Um, the people that we encounter often are people who really have had no access to language at home. Um, not a lot of access, some access to gesture, but definitely no, not enough exposure to something as input that would trigger them to really learn language. So they come with a tiny um, set of lexical items, single gestures that go usually with whole events. So this is um, Jean Maris, who's now at Gallaudet. He was down there collecting data with us um, on the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua. And he's showing a set of pictures. It really doesn't matter. It's different kinds of food mangoes, hamburgers, corn, sandwiches, and this is what this particular, this is a first contact case. This is what this particular uh, person has as, as her repertoire for all those things. And if you're having trouble seeing the difference, you're not having trouble. One thing, it's, it's the same thing for all the kinds of food, for eating, for are you hungry, for have you eaten yet, it's, that's it. And that's very common. People typically, um, isolates will come with maybe 5 to 12 signs, maybe bathroom, sick, eat. Now, um, this is another case. I'm trying to show you what people bring to language. In the upper, I mean, in the lower corner here, you're going to see an 11-year-old girl. This is also the first day we had in contact, of contact with her. And I'm, I'm showing you the first contacts with these people because there's something that happens very quickly after first contact with the deaf community that it's important for you to, to have a, a picture of. So what she's doing is she's watching this movie called Mr. Kumal Flies Like a Bird. And She's looking through a camera so she can see the picture. I cannot see the picture. I periodically look to see what the picture is. But I'm just asking her to gesture to me, to communicate to me however she can, what she sees there. And this is pretty typical of first time um, contact. 
So you get the picture, he goes up, he wants to fly, he falls down a lot. Finally, he, he puts on a bunch of feathers, and in the end, he crashes into a mountain, he takes the feathers, he sets up a business and sells Indian headdresses. So if you, you know, I'll leave it out there, I'm not going to waste time watching it. But this is her rendition of this. <clears throat> And she's watched it once or twice all the way through already. Now she's watching it again. The first time through, that's all I got. A few of the others, the first time through, I got something like this, something like that. I'm even trying to gesture to see if I can get her to do anything. I just want you to see what a, what a Nicaraguan sign language signer of, of the full-blown language looks like. So this is someone who has a deaf in it. <coughs> Climbing the mountain, smelling the flowers being on the top, looking and seeing the bird that's flying and his wings spread. He says, I want to be the same. He tries to fly, falls down. He has a dream <coughs> where he's flying. And he thinks to grab, the, the, the bird is laughing, the feathers are falling, grabs the feathers puts them on, stands on top of the mountain, actually stands on top of the mountain and puts them on, jumps off and again falls and crashes. He wants to fly, you know, he tries to collect feathers, he puts more on himself and flies, but again falls and crashes. So he waits until night and he sees these chickens. And he runs in and he takes these feathers, puts them in a big bag, climbs to the top of the mountain. And again, now he puts feathers all over himself, making huge wings. And he flies, <coughs> swoops a bit, crashes into the mountain, which crumbles. And as he wakes up and he looks at the, there's no feathers on his arm. The other one, he sees the feathers and he thinks, huh, what I'll do is I'll make these Indian headdresses and I'll sell them for eggs. So he gives the eggs and he takes the eggs. Okay. That's the ending there is a buy sell scenario. And it's he's talking about lines of kids who are giving eggs to someone and that person's giving them the Indian headdresses. The person below is just going to do that piece again so you can see another Nick Robin side. She does not have deaf family, but she's been at the deaf school for the young age. And the kids are coming here. She folks on kids coming up in the line taking the headdresses. Putting them on, they get the headdresses put on them. Person takes the eggs, puts them in the cash register. So there's two versions of what would be Nicaragua and Sunday. There's like you have the juxtaposition between what these kids have when they walk into the door and what they have when they leave. Um, yesterday, Susan mentioned a study that she did where she looked at parents of um, deaf children and how they sign. And we did the same sort of a thing with, uh, with mothers, usually, of kids that we were testing. And usually in the first trip, we would test a child. This is the child who only signed basically fly, go up, fall down. Um, but her mother signed a ton of actions. Directionals, modifiers, actors, objects, not a ton of those, but a huge number of these sort of action type um, gestures. In fact, when you look at her mother and you look at what we call contact gestures, the enriched version of communication that we think fooled deaf kids into creating a language, she looks very much like them. The only problem is she never uses that with her child. She uses single gestures. So this is just a real quick summary. You've got the, the Nicaraguan story. You've got kids in cities and rural areas. Schools were set up after the, right before the revolution closed, and then up again after the revolution. Some kids went to those local schools. Some kids stayed isolated. The ones who went formed a contact communication between themselves. When they came together, there was no, in the homes, people were doing language for them. When they came together, they were all people without 
a, a communication system, but with the um, desire to communicate. So they start to try to gesture to each other. They start repeating, they repeat each other's stuff, and a contact communication among gesture systems occurs, which crucially is repetitious and periodic. And they're repeating a lot because they're not understanding each other and no one's doing the language for them. There's a pigeon, I can explain this later if you want, between deaf and hearing. It's unrelated to this process, but um, I, I'll go into that if, if any questions if you want to hear more about it. But what happens is very young kids, there was a point at which everyone who came into the school was not a user of any language, but they were these gestures. And they came into the school, the schools were oral, they were not permitted to sign in the classrooms, they were permitted to sign on the buses and in the playgrounds and with each other. And they, they communicated with each other using gestures. The young ones gave birth to Nicaraguan Sign Language. And if you look at what came out from the young ones in comparison with their input, it's vastly different. And I'll talk about some of those characteristics in a bit. But right now, I just want you to get the process, which is the language came into being, and then it fed it back into that pool. So now in that pool, we have non-language gesture, I mean, gestural contact stuff plus Nicaraguan sign language. So now young kids coming in are getting the language models and the gestural models. And the gesturers are now getting a language model as well. So younger children are more fluent and in essence providing language modeling to older children. Once you have a language, it's funny how if you don't have a language, nobody cares about contact. But when you have a language, you suddenly start contacting with other languages. You start to get borrowing them from other languages so the nature of that pool was a very transient, short period of time in which we could see um, no, no language in there, and then the, the language coming in before the language started to interact as it normally would with other languages. One question that exists in the literature is, <coughs> I call it, is it soup yet? You have all these ingredients, um, but when does it actually become soup? And this is my sort of diagram of it, just so you see. Um, you've got the language, you've got the Nicaraguan science, and you have cohort after cohort after cohort feeding back into the school and feeding the language that they've learned. So there are successive generations of acquirers. And the question is, does an emergent language become more complex with each new generation? Senghas has, has argued, yes, she's argued that there are things, there are regularities, there are things that come into the grammar over time. But when? When is it a language? Is it done now? Is it done at the third cohort, the fifth cohort? Are they, are they um, zebra binges? Um, I, I feel that this is a valid question, but I also feel that it's the core language properties that should be telling us whether it's a language or not yet. It's not new things that get added, new you know, ways that agreement is done, um, regular. Those things are historical change over time. I, I want, what I want to focus on in this piece is when is it language? Language is going to change, especially new language. So I would argue that the most of this is historical change. And in fact, after the first generation that is young enough to be exposed to that input, I see what I feel is the core, the core properties of language. I don't see a criterial feature that's missing. I see change, but I don't see a criterial feature that's missing. So I do ask the question, are deaf children zebra finches? Um, you know, does it take several successive generations for an emerging language to become fully fledged? So for me, it's those core factors, and I haven't seen anything. You'll, as you'll see, I see C command, I see hierarchical, you know, hierarchical structure and grammatical rules that are sensitive to it. I see all the constructions that we see in spoken languages. So, you know, I, I, historical change can introduce complexity, it can reduce complexity. It can introduce clutter with historical artifacts, it can spread regularity, but language status does not change as a result of that. So the, the question is, does the input from the group the second question about the zebra finches, which is why I asked um, Tecumseh yesterday about the analysis where he said, well, the problem was they didn't look at the individual bird, they lumped them all together. Well, if you think of the community that you're exposed to, as
as a, a, a beehive of, of information, it's possible that the sum of the parts will better fool an individual than the input from a single signer. So if you have a lot of kids all trying to communicate with each other, repeating each other, repeating what they're doing and throwing things out there, your impression of the data, the data may actually be richer in its um, entirety than it would be for any one member of the group. Now, on the other side of that, we do have family sign language situations where there's an older sibling and then a younger sibling and sometimes one more, sometimes up to five more siblings down the line. And we see that the oldest one remains sort of very limited in their language use, but the younger ones show native-like uh, development of signing. It's not Nicaraguan sign language, it's a kind of family sign language. It has similarities because it pulls on the gesture system in ways, and they, so they usually die out. As the person is in contact with the deaf community, that family system gives way to the sign language itself. So we know that you can have one-to-one -one um, but that's, you know, the, the issue here is what do you really get when you've got this huge number? So this is just a map of, I usually do it piece by piece, but I don't want to waste time. Um, this is, we've covered most of the country, that's the point. Up on the Rio Coco, we missed a little bit on the bottom. <coughs> but we've covered the country in our doing a population study, so we have now about 2,800 samples, 450 of which are language isolates of first contact. And our work um, started in red, red kind of purple here in the Managua area and, and led up to like Leon down to the Costa Rican border. And then we branched out to the, um, the, the Atlantic coast after the Contra War. And then we just sort of spread out. And right now, a lot of our work is on that little lake, on the big lake that's down there below, and in Condega in the mountains in the area of the hurricane mission here. So again, we've got to define a few things. Gestures. Gestures tend to be holistic. They don't lend themselves to compositionality or minimal contrast. They're typically a single gesture associated with a whole event. And gestures function, for me, they function as a human call system, and they're effective in that role. It's not that gesture slowly developed into language somehow, it's still here. And it serves a function. If that data projector was about to fall on Johan's head, gesture would be a lot better than, by the way, the data projector is about to fall on your head. So gestures serve a purpose for us. <laughs> Gesticulation. Susan was calling, when she was talking about gesture in her talk, um, I, 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 I realized what she's talking about is gesticulation. She's talking about the gesture that co-occurs with speech. Now, that's a little bit different from the gesture that I'm talking about. There are emblems that are single signs that can, uh, or single gestures that, that can affect whole events, but there's also some periodic stuff going on in the gestures that she's looking at that are language controllers. You know, I'm not saying that the parents aren't doing this. Um, they are. Uh, but we don't find the co-speech gestures, the things that sort of regulate conversation, focus on things, to be as influential on the problem as the more emblematic stuff or the gestures that are occurring, as, not necessarily with speech. Gesture alone is insufficient to trigger the first language acquisition process. If it were, if it were fine, it would trigger the first language acquisition process, we'd be done. We wouldn't have to worry about anything. Home signers wouldn't be in you know, wouldn't would be struggling to have all the full expression of the language. Um, and I make a strong claim, and that is that deaf gesturers left in gesturing homes remain cognitively intact, but languageless. And I'm not saying they remain communicationless. They have communication, and they can have richer and richer degrees of it. And in fact, if their parents shut up and actually signed the way that they could sign, um, the input would be different because it would be driven. What we find is that parents who, who shut up and, and try to gesture um, without the use of speech will often be driven by word order and characteristics of the spoken language around them. So we get nouns where we never see them in the typical gestural input. Um, but for the most part, that's not happening. It's kind of an interesting question as to why. So this is a woman who's, who's come into adulthood and um, is still 
a, a, a nice one. She still has no, she's gone beyond critical period. She has very little ability to, to communicate. She can't tell time. She works. She, she works for a police officer. She makes him breakfast. She makes him lunch. She makes him dinner. And her time telling is when two hands on the clock are here, when the two hands on the clock are here, and when the two hands on the clock are here, she knows she has to go do whatever she's going to do. She, if you passed her in the street, you'd think she was probably a secretary working in some office. But she couldn't tell me her name. She couldn't tell me how many kids she had. Um, I went home with her, and she pulled out pictures and, and showed me. Uh, the woman with her is someone who we started to work with when she was 29. Um, who has had lots of gestural exposure and lots of exposure to Nicaraguan sign language. She actually sort of functions as a visual gestural interface for us when people like the one we're going with that. So what I just want to show you is there, there's a um, the Bowerman test, topological relations test, has all kinds of pictures of spatial relations. So this one looks like this. It's the book on the shelf. And all we're doing is asking her to sign that. What we can get out of her um, with great patience is maybe one gesture. So what I want you to watch for is just when she does this, that's her, the book is on the shelf, her gesture for that. But then we, we sort of point to things, we look at things. What I want you to see is her conceptual structure is not problematic. She sees all the things. She can actually name most of the things that are in the picture. She just can't put them together in any sort of configuration that is language. That's, that's the response. Now she gets her to sign book. She points to the shelf. She gives her gesture for shelf. She copies the brick wall. But it's like the blind men, you know, come six angles on the elephant. Each one of those is a separate thing for her. They don't fall together. I just want to show you one thing, just in case you don't deal with Nicaraguan culture. But Zelly is using a nose nose wrinkle, which is a Nicaraguan gesture. What's that? What's that? But you're going to see that take on grammatical function. So I think you should see what it is. So on a population-wide scale, language emergence happens still on an individual by individual basis. When the conditions for language emergence are all met, um, and the languages influence each other. There's a critical period. We think of it as sort of below the, the age of reason. But really, it's a kind of combination of work by Lenneberg, work by Newport, work by Mayberry, that shows us that the door starts to close around age 7 or 8, and it fully closes around 15 or 16. And you can ask me, there are some interesting exceptions to it, which tell us that language can be learned in a way other than the natural way that we learn it. Um, the proportion, like with Creoles, proportion is more important. Six man family members deaf, six man family members hearing, more likely to have a family sign language than one family member deaf in a family of three. The time course is the interesting thing. That's the one I just want to, I want to focus on. Once someone sees, the periodic nature of signing. It's less than a few days before they start doing things. And it can be nonsense. It can be putting together every gesture they've got randomly, but they are driven to, to engage in the same kind of rhythmic, periodic stuff. And so, so if you're beyond critical period, you'll never get a language. But if you're within critical period, you get a language even if there wasn't one there. So again, this is another story. I'm not going to watch the whole thing, but I'm going to show you a, a person who was a language isolate who's now for about two weeks been in contact with other signers, is, is using gestures and is starting to put them together. And as you watch, I've glossed them for you. All she's doing is action, 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 action. But I want you to have the feeling of, you know, if you don't know, it's going to look to you like that might be a sign language. I want you to be con in the same way that deaf kids are con into thinking that's a language and then learning them.
in, at first contact, it was just sign, sign, sign. But now it's starting to look fluid. So if you imagine lots of people doing that, um, you'll get a sense of what's going on. So the, the, the guy you're seeing there is just a Nicaraguan signer um, signing it in Nicaraguan sign language as per contrast. And he's doing agreement. She's doing all kinds of role shifts without ever shifting her body or indicating it in any way. So she's, she's using her body to become all these people, but there's no signal when she changes. And he's doing very clear role shifts as well. Okay, so um, I'm out of time, uh, but what I have for you, I mean, as I'm, as I'm wrapping up, I can say you're, you're seeing here, look at that, looks like language, contact signers, contact gesturers, but you can see, and these are people who've been doing it for years, you can see how a young child exposed to that would go that to sign language. These are young kids who do have Nicaraguan sign language. It's all over the place now, so most kids are being exposed to Nicaraguan sign language, not here, unless they're still gesturing at home. So the conditions are, you know, what are the right conditions? You just have to get enough people together doing things that trigger those, those four instincts. And if you trigger them within the critical period, you should get language. Um, I'm going to very quickly, if I can take a minute of my questions, do this. So what comes with language emergence? And I argue the whole shebang. So I'm just going to quickly lay out for you some of the things that, that happen. Utterance is previously limited to a verb plus a single argument. So verb, one argument, and, and they're, they're sort of linked together. Um, no more than that. Single valence become multi-argument verbs. Where there was no systematic verb agreement, now the system divides into three classes that every sign language has recognized, inflecting, plain, and spatial verbs. Um, sign language linguists now recognize these classes as an implication of universal. But if you really analyze them, what you'll see is it's even more regular. Direct arguments never exhibit spatial agreement with the verb, but they're registered by a semantic classifier that's in the blue slot of the verbs consistently. Verbs incorporate, the, high, the language is highly applicative. They incorporate locatives, directionals, and basically agree with the objects of those. They incorporate the licensors of data, experiencers, and agree with their objects. So, you know, John enjoys music is on John, you know, enjoys music. It's like a dative subject. Um, they agree with person and are additional, additionally marked uh, by an orientation morphing to distinguish person agreement from spatial agreement. Non-psychological body-anchored verbs end up employing an auxiliary to get their agreement. And there's a parallel thing going on in kinship relations, so you can get things like my book, but she to me can't. Um, the three classes, I think, are evidence of agreement. Syntax, the nose wrinkle that you saw her do, in the contact gesturing can go with words like what, who, but in the, as soon as you get the emergence of the sign language, you see that facial expression spreading over C command domains. Same is true of yes, no, face, facial marking on conditionals. Relative clauses in Nicaraguan sign language, don't see them in the earlier stuff, you see them in the first groups, and they're marking a, like a little lip point, they're taking a lip point from right here that's occurring to give you which um, element in, the, in what looks like headless relatives is the head of the relative clause. Um, verb, the languages are the emergent languages, verb centered, serialized, initial agreement with object. Um, These are just, I'm not going to go into this, these are the various cognitive tests we do <coughs> to see that um, the people we're dealing with are cognitively intact as well as the, even if they have no language. And what you'll see is the only problem that the home center show is on delayed recall and things like the rail figure. Um, memory is a problem. Sequential memory, you know, they talk about it maturing and, and, and us getting sequential memory for language through the maturation process. I see nine, ten-year-olds who don't have language, they're not showing that serial memory. The woman you saw that was just doing verb, 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 can't put two things together to create a, um, a thing. Um, and just the last piece I thought people would be interested, we have one area where all of Nicaragua have been evil eyes a big thing. There's a belief that if you stare hard at a child, that they will get sick. And so people go, 
if I stare hard at this child, they're going to get even sicker. So we have people like this woman who we encounter at age 28, who no one has been making eye contact with for fear they'll make her sicker. So she has no gesture. She's not only no sign language, she has no gesture. And when she saw the sign, the, the signing, she immediately went to get this to work. Now, there's nothing here, but she, this is her going after that periodicity, where she wasn't before. Single little gestures, that was it. it means nothing. It took two weeks with this person holding cups and moving things to get her to do a single gesture that was representative of moving or acting on something. This was way well beyond critical period. But the non-contact of eye gaze and things. Are there criterial features? Yes. These are what I think are your criterial features. And they're all there. I don't think more vocabulary gives it to you. I think that You've already got the language there. The language is going to expand in vocabulary over time. Does it make it more complex? It's going to change some of the syntax. Sure. But it's it is the conclusion. It is the conclusion. But that's it. Um, you know, uh, those are these are invocational universals. I'll leave that up, and I'll conclude with I just tried to give you a taste of how a kid could be fooled. But I think that those those four properties these. Are, are really central here. And, the, and I think the first one may be something, you know, what is it that's drawing us to repetition, periodicity, people stringing all these signs together, other than, gee, this, this is probably a very highly likely place to see something that's emerged. And we don't see it in any complex more than bringing two things together in the contact gesturing. But as soon as the kids look at that, they produce things that are higher up in their structure. So that's where we are. Thank you.